COVID, I haven't been able to travel that much, but um, pre-COVID, we have, we have Los Angeles, Vancouver, Kelowna, a little bit in Northern Michigan, um, all over the GTA and Southern Ontario, and a little bit out East in uh, Nova Scotia and Antigonish. And as Anna mentioned, you know, select publications and, and platforms I've been featured on include Designs, Azure, Dwell, Interior Design Magazine, Canadian Interiors, Design Milk, World Architects, Design Raid, Design, and many more. Oops. Let's see here. So an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, workflow and projects is going to be the biggest component. This is where I actually walk you through an entire shoot and show you how we how images are crafted from start to finish. Um, go into some differences between just a regular photographer and an architectural photographer. Photography and its relationship to the business of architecture, establishing narrative through your photos, uh, finding the right photographer, expanding the reach of your images, planning a successful shoot, um, understanding the business of photography and cost sharing, and lastly, tips and tools for making your own architectural photos. So in this section with work phone projects, I've got three projects I want to talk about, the Brian Mulroney Institute, Cornicle Terra Queen West, and the St. George Cono renovation. Um, in each section, uh, I'm going to break down maybe one or two images, and you're going to ac actually get to see how the whole capture process from start to finish, including the retouching, the brief I see received from the client as well. Uh, so the first project I'm going to be talking about, Brian Mulroney Institute, this was in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. This was commissioned by Moriyama and Tashima, Ellis Don, Origin Studios, and uh, Barry and Langeel Architects. And um, when I first met with the client, they, they presented me with these renderings and they really wanted to try to recapture these renderings as true as possible. They really showcased some of the key elements within the space. So for this particular angle, they really wanted to incorporate the staircase that you see on the left. There really wasn't another great angle to, to shoot the staircase. So it was kind of important that we we capture this one as true to possible, uh, as true as, as possible. Um, and in the middle, they actually have a replica of Brian Mulroney's office. So it's everything as it is while he was in parliament. Um, and on the back right hand side there in the, the last red box, um, you'll see there's a little steeple off the distance. The building is actually elevated on a hill with a view to the lower campus. And the building was aligned in such a way that it, it kind of synced up with the steeple off on the right hand side. So it was part of their narrative that they had with the positioning of, of the building. Uh, but with projects like this, there are some logistical challenges. We booked this um, kind of last minute. We wanted to get there before the leaves fell off the trees. So it was planned during reading week. What you see on the left is actually how the project looked, uh, I'd say 85% of the time. It was really quiet, really empty. Um, and you'll notice if you pay really close attention to some of the final photos, I've reused some of the students two or three times um, in the same shots or different angles. Um, it, it, it's a little bit more challenging to make it feel populated when it's like this, but it does mean you have a lot more control. You can tweak chairs, you can you can adjust things, you can remove things that you don't really like or that don't make sense. Um, so it's got its pros and cons. And unbeknownst to us, actually on the very first day that we were shooting, the architect from the office flew in from, I think flew in from Ottawa at the time. And uh, we, we were shooting along and uh, we go out for lunch and we come back and there's a truck out front and they're just loading out these tables everywhere. And we're kind of freaking out, the architect and I. We're like, what do we do? We're, we're supposed to be here for two days. Um, and uh, we're, we're talking to the guys. We're, we're trying to figure out, like, uh, can we get them to take them out? And they, they couldn't do it. They had these, like, 20 tables they had to deliver. And they had them in all these specific spots. And, um, you know, eventually we were like, you know what? We, we just have to stay. We have to wait a little bit longer. Um, the tables were supposed to be there all weekend. so. I had all this extra time to kind of focus on other elements of the project. And then at the very end of the shoot, we had this kind of crunch time where I could photograph this hallway while it was completely empty. So this is the actual composition and how the space actually looked. And this is what you're seeing here is just a really like, standard photo if you were to walk in and kind of just frame this and set it up. But there's a few big technical challenges from a photography standpoint here. The Mulroney office replica has a lot of reflections and it's actually a really dark space. Like in the middle of the day, it's really hard to capture what's inside and showcase that. Um, and lastly, the view of the lower campus, the steeple is a little bit off to the right. You know, the hallway does line up dead center with the steeple, but unfortunately the angle they wanted, I had to be a little bit more off to the right-hand side and we had to crop that. So you'll see how I address this on the, uh, on the next slide. Oops. 
So what you're seeing here on the left is a GIF of every photo I captured that day. I went really dark and early. I think I was there at like 5.30, 6 a.m. I set up the shot and I'm, I'm just waiting for people to start filling in the space, for light to fill in the space. But what was really important here was that I went early enough to capture a clear exposure of the Mulroney office replica. So you can see me popping off some strobes. And the rest of the day, I'm just waiting for people, movement, life to kind of come in and do its thing. And on the right hand side is a photo I took just with my, my backup camera. I just wanted that piece to show the whole steeple off in the distance there. So I could Photoshop that later and move it over a little bit more. And here's just a breakdown of my layers in Photoshop. So we've got the base layer, which was taken pretty early in the day. We bring in some, uh, some light for the office. Start to bring in students, which I captured later on in the day. Luckily, this was at the, the end after they had removed the tables and students were starting to come back for classes. So I managed to get some people on this one. And all we're doing here is just populating this, the space, trying to come up with like a little bit of a narrative, a flow for movement, and then we're cleaning up the reflections and anything that's unwanted in the frame there. And just a quick before and after. So this would be like a, a typical daytime shot if you just walked in and took a photo and the photo that we that ended up getting delivered to the client. I'll just do a quick before and after here. And all the photos I'm going to show you today are up on my website. So you're welcome to go take a look at these um, later on. I'll leave a link to that at the end of the, the presentation. And uh, just for reference, here's the, you know, the rendering on the right hand side. There was some budgetary constraints. So I think certain elements can turn, didn't turn out the way they had hoped, but the project is really beautiful. Like in person, it just gets amazing light all day long. And some of my favorite photos of uh, that particular year came from this project. It was really memorable and really enjoyable. Uh, here's another reference on the right hand side is another rendering. Um, in this case, they had some visuals that they've got up on the wall on the right hand side, but in real life, they, they unfortunately couldn't get them in there. So it just made more sense to go a little bit more dead central uh, with the, the framing and the composition of the photo. And same thing with the space here. This is the very last morning I was there and luckily all these people came through and, and filled it up. So we did manage to get some nice shots with lots of students in there. And on the right hand side here, you'll see there's a rendering of, I guess, their equivalent of a drone shot. And because I was there for so long, I managed to capture lots of exteriors with different lighting conditions, uh, different weather. And uh, it, it was just nice being able to have all these extra angles to show them um, when everything was all said and done. And here's just a quick overview. I think in this project, because I was there for so long, I ended up capturing about I think it, sorry, I delivered about over 60 images. So it was pretty extensive. It was a lot, like that's unheard of as far as I'm concerned when it comes to, to what clients expect from a shoot. But the, the time that I was there really gave me a lot of opportunity to kind of just walk around and really get a feel for the space, kind of live in that environment. Um, and in a sense, work a little bit more casually, which was really nice. It was nice to not feel rushed until the very end when I had to get a few key shots. So. Um, yeah, this is uh, from, from a personal standpoint, from my experience, one of my favorite shoots of, um, of that year. Uh, next project is Forno Cultura Queen West. This is in Toronto. This is by J Architects, Forno Cultura and uh, PLT Construction. So considerations for this, the large steel windows invite the public into the bakery. I think this used to be an old mechanics garage and the windows are where the bay doors used to be is what I, I remember reading that somewhere. Um, interiors need to show the juxtaposition between the calm cafe and the busy production side of the space. This will make sense once you see some of the interior photos. Um, and on the bottom right hand side, you'll notice there's these barrel vaulted wraps. Uh, you want those to feel accentuated for the interior shots. So ideally that means you're going as low as possible and you're making them feel really big and warped, but obviously there's some challenges with that. And you'll see how we address them a little bit later. Um, logistical challenges for the space. This project was uh, a bit of a nightmare. Um, the parking lot out front that you see there on the top left, it's not managed by the bakery. It's, it's like its own little independent parking lot. It's just, it's crazy. It's full all the time. Um, and they really wanted this elevation shot. I really wanted it too, because I knew it was going to be a, like an amazing photo to have. So I actually had to go back three times for this shoot to get that. I, I tried going really early in the morning on weekdays, but 
there's a construction site across the street, so it, it's full right away. I had to go back on like a Sunday at like five or six a.m. to get to get the photo. You'll you'll see it on the next page. Um, the building's been vandalized with graffiti, which means I'm already dreading Photoshop work when I get home. Um, and the cafe has really high foot traffic. So what you see on the bottom left is actually how it looked the first two times I went. It was just insane. You really can't even see any of the work that's been done. There's just so many people coming through the space. Um, another thing too is that the, the kitchen operates seven days a week from 4 a.m. or the bakery operates seven days a week from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, normally when you're shooting in, in restaurants, you, you kind of want a bit more control, especially if, if you can see the production space. You want to be able to clean things up a little bit more and, and tidy it up and, and make it look a little nicer. But this just wasn't an option here. Like the, it was such a fast paced bakery. There was just so much clutter, so much going on all the time. You're really at the mercy of, of, of the staff and, and what they needed to do that day. So uh, it was constantly ebbing and flowing through, through throughout the shoot. Um, so here's the exterior angle. Uh, in this case, you know, like I said, I went bright or dark and early, and uh, we managed to get maybe 15 minutes with no cars in there. So all you're seeing here is three bracketed exposures. This one's really simple. The last one was like 60 images that I had to go through. This is just three or four shots that like, just, it's really just for Photoshop, making sure I'm getting different variations of, of exposure so I can blend it all together later on. And here's a breakdown of my layers. This one is a little more simple. Uh, we've got a background copy, just for light cleanup, remove the graffiti, slight desaturation of the blues, so they feel a little bit more muted, and just a, a contrast option as well. I'll just let that play back. Okay. And just a quick before and after. Before, after, before, and after. And once again, you can you can see all these on my website too. Um, so here's the interior angle. Um, so technical challenges this shoot. On the right-hand side, product area needs to remain clear and visible. You saw how busy it can get in there. So you have to be really patient, wait for people to kind of clear out that space. Reflections hide the production area. We want to show that relationship between the two sections. Um, to get around this, we use polarizing filters. In this case, they did a fantastic job at just making it clear and visible. The front seating should remain open. So when people start to sit down in restaurants and camp, like cafes, you want to have flow into the space. You want to feel like you're being pulled into it. If someone sits down, you're going to run into some issues. Um, so we, we want to try and keep at least one table open if we can. Uh, the barrel, barrel vaulted wrap should feel accentuated. You know, to really make it feel exaggerated, you want to go really low and you want to make them feel really tall. But in this case, because there's people in the shot, you kind of need to find a balance. You want to be, you know, roughly at head height and you want to be able to see over the crowd of people, but you don't want to feel like you're, you're floating down on them. There's also the legal aspect of this too. Um, what are the rules around photographing people in public? Uh, it's a bit of a gray zone with what we operate in. I tend to stick to the notion of um, sort of like expectation hey. of privacy. If you're... Okay, one second. If you're out in public, uh, you know, I'm not hiding what I'm doing. My camera's there, I'm visible. Usually if people have any issue with that, they come up and talk to me. I try to be really open and honest about the whole process and what's going on. If someone has a big problem with it, I'll blur their face if I have to, or I will uh, just wait till they leave the scene altogether. Um, but you know, it's, it's really about using your best judgment, reading the room, getting a feel for the space, and most importantly, being really respectful to people that are around you and um, not making them feel like you're, you have malicious intent with what you're doing. So here's the capture process. It was a little bit quieter here this time, which was nice. Um, but you can see it's still pretty busy. You'll notice when people start to sit down, it just starts to block the flow on the left-hand side. So you really want to keep that open. And here's just the retouching the layers here. So we're bringing in the, the polarized piece for the glass, cleaning that up on the right-hand side, um, cleaning up the back so we have, it feels a little bit more open, some highlights, general cleanup, and then just color correction for the final touches.
Oops. Let me get through this. So just a quick before and after. Before af or after. And before and after. And in this case, because I had to go back so many times because the parking lot was so busy and the space was so busy, um, you know, I captured this angle. The architect loved it. This is the one that ended up getting featured on Azure, but um, you know, it shows lots of life in the space, lots of movement, but it doesn't really show the work that well. So we, we, when we went back for the last time, we ended up recapturing this angle. You'll see I went a little, little bit lower, so the wraps feel a little bit bigger. The space is a lot cleaner. You can see a lot more of the bench work and the custom chairs and tables they made on the left-hand side. The product as well on the right looks a little, quite a bit cleaner. If I go back to this shot, we just didn't have the ability to clean all that up when people were walking in and out of the space. Um, but in this case, we had a lot more time. We could work a little bit slower and um, we just made it feel a little bit more succinct. So the architect here ended up using this photo. You know, this is the one that ended up getting published. It's really personal preference, uh, depending on what you're trying to say as, a, as an architect to, to your clients, right? Um, but yeah, just an interesting part with this one. And here's just a quick overview from the whole shoot. This was also a really fun shoot, even though it, it was a lot of going back and forth. Um, but, you know, I got fed really well. I came home every day with a baguette. So I was pretty, pretty happy with this one. Really good coffee too. So can't complain. <laughs> and the last project is the St. George Condo renovation. This is by Post Architecture and the contractor is Art of Dwell. I want, the reason why I want to show you um, a condo over a house project is that condos pose a, some really unique challenges. They're really small spaces and um, you get these extremes in light and it, they're, they're, they're actually more difficult, I'd say, to shoot than some bigger projects. So it's, um, yeah, it's just from a photography standpoint, it's a lot more challenging to work with. So some considerations here. Um, the size of the condo could not be expanded. Emphasis was placed on maximizing storage and opening up partitions in the space. This was in a really old building. Uh, new millwork needed to be featured and the images need to flow from the, show the flow from the front to the back of the unit. So the, the rendering I want you to focus on the most is the one on the top right up there. You'll see a little silhouette of a person in it. Um, you'll notice in the middle, there's a glass partition that breaks up the office and the living room. That needs to be featured, that needs to be clear. And originally the architect wanted to showcase this top right angle as is. You know, If we could get the whole thing looking like this, that would, that would have been fantastic. But in this case, um, it just made sense to go a little bit tighter. You know, you can go really wide. You can show everything in there if you really want, but you know, this isn't real estate photography. We're trying to keep everything really to the point and really focused on the quality of the space. Um, you don't need to have everything in, in every single shot. So, and uh, another thing too is when, the, when you go with wider lenses, especially in smaller spaces like this, you tend to get a lot of distortion, a lot of warp, and uh, the photos just look a little bit weird. So, you know, I really pushed for for going for a tighter frame like this. Um, reflections in the glass and notice are really bad. Um, in this case, the polarizer worked, but in some cases, we actually have to bring a big black cloth or, or kind of like a big scrim and we hold that up and that'll kill the, the reflections and we composite that later on in Photoshop. Uh, another thing too, the lights give out really bad hot spots, like they just kind of explode. Um, most of the time I find with architecture, no lights on is a better look. It just feels a little bit more natural, a little bit more airy to the space, but sometimes you need to photograph with lights because they bring out textures, they bring out materials. If they're really unique or custom lights, definitely showcase them in the photos too. But you can do that selectively. They don't need to be on for every photo. You can kind of pick and choose um, when you think they will have the most impact in the image. And then, as I mentioned too, you know, we went with a tighter frame here um, rather than incorporating everything else to the right of the, the red box there. So here's the capture process. Um, and what we're doing here, this is the architect and her daughter, and we're just having them interact in the space showcase some of the nooks that they incorporated. And you'll notice we do a lights on, lights off version as well for, for Photoshop later on. And yeah, we're just getting all the pieces we think we might need for, uh, for Photoshop. Here's a breakdown of layers. This one was a little bit more challenging in, in post than some of the other ones, um, a lot more cleanup but we're just brightening up the space, bringing in people, cleaning up some of the highlights that don't make sense with the light off, lights off, changing the tones of the materials so they feel a little bit more even, bringing in the table, 
bringing in the, the architects, final cleanup, and then color correction. And just a quick before and after, before, after, before, and after. Um, one thing you'll notice here too about this particular photo is like straight out of the camera, um, especially when you're, you're working with a mix of artificial and natural light, you tend to get really extreme color tones and whites. So like, you know, all this is, all the walls are white here. We know they're white, but you know, the camera's picking up this blue tinge on the right-hand side and as you go deeper and darker into the space, you get this yellow tinge. So in Photoshop, what we tend to want to do is, is tone those down a little bit so it feels a bit more even, a bit more balanced. Um, it, I'd say it changes with every photographer depending on their level of taste and also you as the client, like what you expect in the image. Um, some clients like it really flat and muted. Some, you don't want to keep it a little bit more natural like what you see here. Um, it, it's personal preference, but it, it's definitely something to be attentive of when you're looking at images, um, just to see if they've been processed and they, someone's taken the time and put the thought and detail into them. And here's a quick overview. And once again, this project is also up on my website, so you're more than welcome to go check it out. So um, photographer versus architectural photographer, what, what are the differences? Um, first and foremost, we use specialized equipment. We've got uh, tilt shift lenses. So, you know, let's say you're using your phone and you want to try and capture a really tall building. You have to hold your phone up and you have to tilt it upwards to get the top. Our lenses allow us to shift the frame upwards while keeping everything straight. So our lines are straight. Uh, it just means we have less Photoshop work. Um, in addition to the lenses though, we know we use slower camera bodies where we tend to focus more on megapixels than like speed or, or focus even. Our lenses are actually manual focus. So um, a lot of the, the specs that a lot of regular people care about with cameras, we don't tend to care about as much. Um, tripods, we, we use really tall tripods. I think mine goes up to eight or nine feet. I've seen some that go up to 12 feet or higher. Um, and then there's also our, our tripod heads as well, our geared heads. We need to make sure everything's precise and level. If you're working with really tight compositions, you don't wanna be rotating your image in Photoshop later on, and then you're missing corners of a piece that you have to figure out how to recreate later on. Uh, so you have to be really, you, you need the right equipment to be, make sure you're doing a really good job on set and you're, you're limiting the post work you have to do later on. Uh, workflow geared towards retouching. I think you saw that we, you know, we work in environments that are ever changing, ever shifting. We, we can't always get everything perfect in camera. And uh, we need to be thinking always ahead for post when we're, we're on these jobs. So, uh, it, you know, I'm constantly being, you know, thinking like, okay, we need a person in this frame. Oh, we need a pop of light over here to fill in this for Photoshop later on. Uh, we should get a black cloth for the reflections here. There's all these little things that we always need to be be trying to, to prepare for, for when we get home and we're stuck behind the computer. Um, understanding of the unique challenges you face when shooting uncontrolled spaces, you know, this is just part of the job. And, the, and the, for this photo here, actually, the offices on the top right, that strip that you see there, um, it was dusk. You know, we had the shot lined up. We told the university what we were doing. Um, everything was confirmed. Security knew we were going to be there, but those offices were completely locked off. We couldn't get in them. And then, of course, the lights are all off. So I had to run, grab security, drag them out of their uh, their their den, and uh, <laughs> and have them walk through and turn on every single light. And they weren't too happy about it, but that's part of the job. And uh, with dusk shots, like that's really important to that everything kind of comes together at once, right? So we're we're always we're always dealing with the unknown on every job, and anything that can go wrong could possibly go wrong. So you have to be um, really conscientious of that. Uh, lastly, attention to light and detail. We are always working with the sun. You know, that's our primary light source for everything we do. So we'll time shots to certain times of day, depending on where the sun hits a building or if it's for interior shots, maybe we'll, we'll photograph, you know, if you want to, let's say you're shooting outside of a window and you want to capture the view outside, we'll wait till later in the day until the exposure is a little bit more balanced or we'll wait till the sun's not hitting directly inside the window. Um, but when, you know, when we get to the planning stage of a shoot, we, we try to figure out when's the best time to, to, to coordinate certain frames uh, based on where the sun is gonna be.
Uh, so photography and the business of architecture. Why, why hire an architectural photographer? Um, you know, the, I think the most obvious reason is that photography plays a crucial part in your branding. You use it for your print material, your website, proposals, uh, publications, awards, uh, social media, the list goes on. Ideally, you're going to get years and years of use out of images too. Um, the other thing too is it's a pitching tool. It helps you, helps a potential client understand the thought process and intent behind your designs. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about establishing a narrative in architectural images because I think that ties into this whole uh, pitching aspect. Um, emphasis on highlighting the, highlighting the best features, option to correct or avoid deficiencies. You know, this is a commercial job. We are 100% here for you. And the photos are really only successful if you can talk to them and use them to, to ideally get more work, right? So we're, if something doesn't quite turn out or, you know, the millwork's a little wonky or maybe there's like a patch of landscaping that isn't done, let us know, like we can fix that or we can avoid it. Um, what's important is that you have images that really depict your project in the best possible light. Um, images have reach, uh, you know, especially with residential projects, not everyone can go and see your, your work. Um, so in a sense, they live through photos to some extent. Um, and photos as well, they, they travel, right? You put them on social media, you put them on your website, they'll get posted, they'll get reblogged, they get passed around. Um, it's, the, it just broadens your, your awareness in the industry and it really helps get your name out there. Uh, closure, this is a really interesting point. Um, it's just nice to have photos that mark the end of a project that kind of um, showcase the project in the best possible light at, at, at its cleanest state. And uh, lastly, it just helps establish competitive, helps establish you in a competitive industry. You know, if you're, if you have a couple potential clients, they're looking at two or three different architects, having great clean photos will just help you stand out a little bit more than someone who's maybe just got photos taken with their phone, or maybe they just have floor plans or maybe just generic shots, right? Um, arguments against cost is a big one. You know, we're not cheap. Um, I will say though, that there are a lot of junior photographers who would love to work with architects and they will happily work within your budget to, to get content for their portfolio. So if you can find those people, they, they, they will be extremely loyal and hardworking for you. Uh, some of my best clients have been clients I started with before I really knew what I was doing when I, when I had one lens, uh, one camera body. Um, another thing too is, 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 you know, we also offer cost sharing too. So if you have a job with lots of other parties involved, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, um, you can actually break up the bill and split it between a couple of different people or companies. Um, I can do it myself, absolutely. Like there's tons of people out there that can take great photos with their camera. But I think you, you know, what, what I try to show earlier is that we really wanna go the extra mile. We really wanna create photos that are unique that necessarily feel natural, but can't be captured easily by anyone else. So, um, you know, we, we, we really, really wanna create meaningful work when we're out photographing architecture. Um, so establishing an architectural narrative through images, I think this is a really important point. When I was in photography school, I was introduced to this photographer named Alex Soth, who some of you might have heard of. And Alex Soth, he, for the first couple of years of his career, he had this um, approach where he kind of picked geographic areas and he would write down these themes of these geographic areas. So he, 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 you know, he did one on Niagara Falls, he did one on the Mississippi River, and he would write down these notions about these places and what, and what they meant. And he would take this piece of paper and he would tape this to his steering wheel and he would, he would drive and he would just look for these themes and look for these ideas. And uh, you know, that really inspired me. And I, I think this approach applies a lot to architecture too. You know, you're, the, the projects you do, they exist in a space and they, they have all these moments, these things going on around them. Um, and we wanna try and capture and find those little moments in, in between. So to help establish a narrative through images, it, you know, the first and most important step is understanding the human story. What were your clients trying to achieve by hiring an architect? And you know, when possible, incorporate your clients into the images. And the photo on the top left here with the slide, which is also the cover photo, um, you know, they had three little daughters and they, uh, the parents wanted to incorporate the slide into the house. And the kids were just amazing. They, they were like glued to me all day. They were running through the, the shots. They were helping me sweep the floor. They were incredible and just having them in there and having them interact with the space and seeing them, seeing how they live and, and how they are day to day was, was a, it just made the photos feel that much more uh, relatable and interesting. 
Um, what design choices did you make to meet your client's goals? You, this doesn't need to be anything big or crazy. Like we're always gonna take overall shots. Sometimes I think the most interesting design choices are the smallest. Um, there was one job I did a little while back where they, in the kitchen island, they incorporated this little nook and they were, um, it, was, it was a little nook just for their dog's food bowls. So it was, it was really quite small, but it was this nice little moment that I think a lot of people, especially people who aren't in the architecture world really relate to and really understand, like everyone loves their pets. Um, and that's just a really nice way to kind of build that connection and um, help make your project that much more memorable. Uh, materials and details, you know, these might not seem important individually, but as a set of images, I think they had a really nice, they're, they're really important. They really talk about um, what you chose to, to feature in this project and like the aesthetic and the feeling of the place. So uh, don't underestimate these shots, like always try to get one or two if you can. Um, show context, you know, your project doesn't need to be the, the central focus in every photo. Um, you're always going to get the, the key images, which will show the, the best elements, but having one or two photos where, you know, like your photo, you know, maybe it's just like a piece of your project hiding behind some bushes or, um, you know, maybe it's like what you see here on the, the second image from the left or from the right, um, where your, your house is really small and you just kind of get this like broad landscape. Um, that's really interesting that, you know, in, in a series of images, I think that adds a lot of appeal to um, understanding the scope of work on a project as well. Um, lastly, avoid tunnel vision on all the points above. You know, this combination is only successful when you utilize all of them individually. You don't want to, to get too caught up on the details or too caught up in the overalls or put people in every photo, you know. You, you kind of have to pick and choose when they work the best. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a calculation, you know, you need it all to kind of be symbi symbiotic and work together. Uh, lastly, is the life of a project, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up more as a conversation point because I think it's something that's been bugging me for a little while now. Um, you know, how does time change how a project presents itself? When does the process of photographing architecture start and end? Um, you know, we, when I'm hired for a job, I'm typically hired for a day or maybe a half day, depending on the scope of work. And ideally, your project is going to be around for a couple of years if it, you know it's a small job maybe decades, maybe even a century. And we are capturing such a small sliver in the life of a building. Um, and I feel like it sells itself short a little bit, you know? At the very least, let's, let's go back and document it in, under different seasons, under different conditions. Um, there's, there's just so much more that's going on around architecture. Um, but you know what, I, like maybe this is something that I think will, this is a conversation piece. Like I'd love to have this talk with someone um, to really kind of understand a little bit better, but it's, it's been in the back of my head for a while. So I just wanted to bring it up and throw it in there on this one. Um, finding the right photographer. So this, this really boils down to one big point and that's what aesthetic appeals to you. Um, and understanding our background is a good, good point of this. You know, I went to fine art photography school, um, which was amazing in many respects. I, I, and when I started photographing architecture, I was really interested in mood and feel, but I, I didn't, understand architecture from an architect standpoint. And I know this is gonna be a lifelong learning process for me. Um, and, you know, luckily I had some really forgiving clients who, who let me go back and, and rework my mistakes and, and clean things up a little bit better. But, you know, just understanding where we're coming from and, and what our intent is and what our understanding and relationship is to architecture and photography um, can help you really improve communication with us. Uh, to this day, I still really value hearing what you have to say about your project and really understanding a project from your perspective. That's super, super important for me because you know, that's the way I can make images that are thoughtful and meaningful. Um, you know, someone from a different background, maybe architecture, engineering, they, they might understand the project. They might really appreciate what the work you've done um, in a very different way than I do, but maybe their photography is not as great. You know, maybe the retouching isn't, isn't quite there. It's, um, it's all kind of relative, right? So just understanding where we're coming from just can help you, you know, like I said, communicate better and, and really, uh, help us understand your, your thoughts and intentions behind the design. Um, review the portfolio. What kind of projects do they showcase? You know, my portfolio, I've, I've shot a lot of projects over the years. Um, I've shot anything from like condos to really ugly, like 1950s buildings that for developments and like rental properties. Um, I, I've done it all, right? Like this is, this is a job for us and I have to kind of like tackle a bit of everything, but my portfolio is really a curated, 
a reflection of what I want to photograph more of or what I'm interested in or maybe a mood or an atmosphere that I'm trying to convey through my work. So if you can see your work through through their lens and, and their portfolio, that's a great indicator that they'll be an awesome fit for the kind of work that, that you're interested in doing. Um, but you know, with that being said, like I, I photograph everything. So um, we're always open. We'll always tackle any job we can. As long as we have time, um, we're, we're always ready to work for you. Um, what publications feature the photographer? Can you see your own work in these publications? You know, work backwards. Uh, this is really easy. Um, where do you want your work to go? And, and just kind of see who's being credited. Uh, are there any images that you'd like that require technical training or certification? So drone imagery is a big one lately. Uh, since 2019, I think they've had some really, um, some really serious rules set in place if you want to use a drone commercially. I had to do a two-day advanced certification course up near Pearson Airport. Um, but now I, I'm, I can fly my drone in downtown Toronto if I want to. I just need to go through the proper paperwork channels, right? Um, but that's something to consider. Working at heights, if you need like a rooftop angle from across the city street, um, having that is awesome too. Insurance is another thing that a lot of photographers, when they're first starting out, they don't have. You know, if I'm on set and I break something, uh, one of your client's objects, or maybe someone trips over my tripod, um, having insurance is just sort of that peace of mind. So it's definitely worth just asking for these things and, and, and seeing, um, or at least thinking about them beforehand. Um, how important is retouching? Are there any unfinished parts of the project that might require Photoshop? Um, the reason why I mention this is that some photographers don't enjoy Photoshop, at least not as much as I do. Um, and they might find, you know, certain tasks a little bit more tedious than others. So just be, you know, be honest, look at your project. If, if you know, like something's not gonna be ready in time, but you need to photograph the house anyway before the homeowners come in um, or, or something like that, let us know um, and we'll see if we can, we can help you out beforehand. Uh, lastly, you know, we're all people, you know, meet us, give us a call, engage with us. If you don't like us, don't work with us. Um, you know, a lot of the best relationships I have with my clients are ones where we just feel like long time or old time friends. And it's been, it might've been like a couple months since we've worked with each other, but we're, we're still great when we meet on set. So um, yeah, just, just, you know, just engage. Um, expanding the reach of your photos. So, you know, back to the whole narrative thing, know your narrative, keep that as a boilerplate. Like what was the story? What, what's going on in this project that you could talk about to potential clients? Um, post on social media regularly, even if it's not professional photos, it adds the wow factor once you see the final images. This could be something as simple as, you know, like driving down a dirt road to today's site or, um, you know, just an overview of some plans that you're working on. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. It just needs to pe keep people engaged and interested in what you're doing. Um, tag everyone involved with the project, material suppliers, tradespeople, engineers. Um, once you tag these people, they're going to start reposting and reblogging. And it's going to feed. It's going to show on their feeds as well, like when they on their their tagged feeds. Um, it's a great way to kind of build roots through social media. Um, also, speaking of roots, hashtags. You can use really generic hashtags too. Like all you're trying to do is just get people who have no idea that you exist to kind of look at your photos and, and be like, oh, that's really cool. Um, pitch to magazines and newspapers. Most publications have an email you can submit to. Um, if you just search whatever the, the publication is and just search submissions. Uh, it should come up most of the time. Um, lastly, you can use platforms like Bowerbird, which puts your work in front of design and architecture journals around the globe. I'm not represented by Bowerbird. They don't pay me anything to say that. The reason why I mentioned them though is that some of my clients have had really good success with them. Um, and uh, they, their work has just exploded by putting it through the pop, that platform. It's not free, but um, it seems to be doing a really good job and, and being really effective. <laughs> Uh, planning a successful shoot. Planning is key. Uh, so first and foremost, know what the images will be used for. I did a job uh, not too long ago and uh, we did the shoot. Client was really happy. We did the whole retouching process. I delivered the final images and I'm about to send the invoice and they get back to me and they say, oh, our website can only take horizontal images. And I'm kind of like, I should have known about this beforehand, you know? Um, always think about the end result. What are you, what are you using the photos for? So just, just have that in the back of your head. Um, share floor plans, renderings, existing images, anything for context. This just helps me understand the scope of work and you know, the, the, how big the project is and, and what was involved in it. Um, anything, for, anything for context is, is really useful. Um, tell us about the project, you know, back to your whole narrative. Is, is there anything we should focus on? Anything we should avoid? Is there anything that we might need to Photoshop later on? Um, let us just help us understand everything from your perspective. 
Uh, scout out the project, review, review proofs, proofs and narrow down what angles stand out to you. Scouting is really important and I try to do it um, for almost every job if possible, depending on how far away it is. Um, scouting just allows me to kind of walk in, see a space through the lens and understand, okay, what kind of lenses do I need to use? What, what, what kind of range can I do here? Maybe I should try a detail shot over here. Um, and actually having an architect do scouting is awesome too, because then I can see what kind of photos you'd be interested in taking if you were to take the photos yourself. So um, scouting between both parties is, is a great way to kind of be prepared for the actual shoot day. Um, manage expectations. Uh, you know, I can't do 20 dust shots at a night. There's just not enough time. Um, and you know, if we scout out a project and we have a planned shot list, the second we start deviating and you know, can we take one more photo here, one more photo here, that messes the whole flow of the shoot up and you really have to be um, conscientious. You know, obviously we'll try to get as many photos in as, as we can, but um, you know, there has to be some, you have to be able to manage that to some extent. Um, plan logistics, do we, do we need security access? Will the homeowners be around? Uh, how will we enter or leave the building? You know, if it's a condo, if we need fobs. Are there any alarms we should be aware of? Um, where are the light switches? This is a big one, especially for like offices or, or big buildings. Um, and do we need to bring or remove furniture or props? The list goes on. We really curate this depending on the shoot. So it, it kind of shifts and changes a little bit, but obviously we try to address um, any specific concerns as much ahead of time as possible. Uh, lastly, join us on the shoot. This is really a collaborative effort and like having an architect on set um, just reinforces the notion that we're on the right path and that we're doing the right thing. You know, in this photo here, I originally had it positioned a little bit more to the left, but you know, the architect was like, no, let's just crop it. Let's go to the right. We want to see more of the, the tiling on the wall there. Um, and you know, little decisions like that, they make a difference and they, they really add up um, in terms of not only how happy we are with the final images, but also you as our clients. Um, cost share is another big thing. I'm going to get into this in two more slides down there, but cost sharing is the best way to mitigate our fees. Um, but before I want to talk about cost sharing, I just want to kind of do a bit of a, a brief on the business of photography. Um, the world of photography really revolves around one notion. It's, it's kind of daunting if you, if you don't understand it, but it's actually really simple. It's that images are property. So if you press the shutter, you are the copyright holder of the image. It's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, no one can take that from you, right? So what needs to be considered when pricing for photography? We've got our equipment, insurance, travel, administrative fees, scouting, uh, training and certification, or shoot time, assistant and retoucher. Um, that can be a big one too. Uh, like I know some bigger photography studios will have maybe two people on staff, maybe three. So that inflates the cost significantly. Um, but all these things add up. And then as you build a reputation in the industry and you become a more well-known photographer, you can start to kind of inflate your base fees. So you're, 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 you're just charging more upfront basically. Um, but the abstract portion is, is the licensing. So what is the value of a photo? How do you determine that? Why is it that I can take a photo and license that and you could take the same photo and maybe, maybe struggle with it. It really comes down to, to reach and demand. So reach is, uh, how many people are going to see this photo? How many eyes are going to be on this on this image? Um, and one thing that impacts the reach, obviously, is the medium. So, like a billboard, that increases the value of a photo. An advertisement, if you're paying, you know, twenty thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars to put your um, an ad of your firm in, in like a magazine, um, that increases the value of an image. So this automatically means a photo is worth more. It has more value. Typically, when when I license photos. I include all your standard marketing collateral um, is included and that's all in perpetuity. But, you know, for something like an, a billboard and an ad, I might charge a little extra. I'll be like, hey, come back. You know, we have to kind of compensate for the difference here. The other thing, too, is that, um, you know, with architecture, one thing that's really unique is that you have to get multiple companies that want to pay for an image at the same time. So, you know, maybe we'll have the engineer, maybe we'll have, you know, um, the mill worker, maybe we'll have anyone who supplied materials for the project, they'll want images. Um, all of this inflates the value of the photos altogether. So with architecture though, as I mentioned, we, we this all happens at the same time. So we tend to get multiple companies. So who cost shares on a project? Like who will split the cost with you? So in this instance, this was um, Bakery at Union Station. We had the architects, we had the shop owner, the limestone supplier, 
The lighting designer and distributor, the millwork designer builder, and the metalwork designer builder all wanted photos of this project. This particular project uh, was on the cover of Canadian Interiors. I think it was project of the year for 2019, if I recall correctly. Um, but yeah, this one actually just blew up. It was, it was crazy. I didn't expect it to get, become so popular. Um, and cost sharing works like this. So let's say you hire me and it's just a one-on-one -on -one transaction. By the way, these aren't my actual rates, but just for reference on how the system works. Um, you're one client, it's $1,000. Um, two clients comes on board, you know what? That's more exposure. The images are worth more money. So that's $1,300, but you know what? You're, you're getting two invoices. So you're paying $650 each. So it's actually more manageable at the end of the day. And I'm being compensated for the increased value of the photos. Uh, three clients, fifteen hundred. Four clients, you know, seventeen hundred. But you're now paying four twenty-five. So this is an amazing system. I'd say ninety percent of my clients use this to mitigate the costs. Um, it does fluctuate depending on the job and, and how many people you can persuade to pitch in. But um, every photographer will have some version. Or architectural photographer will have some version of this. I can't really give you a set. Um, percentage as to like how much it increases because that changes depending on who you're working with but um it, it's it's an amazing system and, and definitely ask about it up front or at least consider it when you know when you're planning a shoot ahead of time Oops. and i think that's the last page here um so architectural photography tips for beginners you know images nowadays they're becoming really important you need if, especially for social media you'll need constant you know stuff to post how can you create your you know, architectural photos that feel meaningful and impactful? Um, these are just general tips and they, you can apply them with your phone or a DSLR, it doesn't really matter. Um, so start with a tighter frame and go wider as needed. Less is more. You wanna keep people curious and engaged. Um, you don't need to show everything all the time. So you know, just little slivers here and there can go a long way. Uh, frame at eye level with furniture or at least start at eye level and then work your way up. You don't want to be too high above furniture because you start to get something that it feels like you're almost plateauing over a table and it just it's not a great look so start low uh you want the furniture to feel light and succinct and like really uh sort of in in line with the whole space itself uh photograph at the right time of day you know the third image from the left here the my detox one um we thought about photographing this during the daytime but you would have had light flooding in and it would have actually you get this effect called blooming when you have too much light coming in and it's where lines and details start to lose their definition around the corners. So in this case, it made more sense to photograph this when it was pitch black out, this is at nighttime. Um, and then you actually get more accurate color tones. It feels more evenly balanced and it's less Photoshop work for me later on to try and bring all that back in. Um, lead lines into the corners of your images. This was a really simple, easy tip. And I use, I consciously make an effort to do this as much as possible. Uh, it's just a great way to make the frame of your image feel meaningful and impactful without too much dead space. Uh, embrace the unpredictable. You know, that includes weather, that includes people. Don't be afraid of photographing in the rain. Don't be afraid of photographing, you know, on a gray day. Um, I, I, for me personally, I find those images sometimes even more interesting than your, your typical sunny day shot. It just has a very different feel, a different mood. Um, I, I, I love that stuff too. And same with people, you know, in the first project I showed you with Moriyama and Tashima, even though that event was planned, I still photographed the space while it was in use. And uh, it, it's just an interesting way to document the space, having it, you know, showing the way everyone else is using it and um, just as the world shifts and changes around it. Uh, show context, like I mentioned before, don't be afraid to go wide. You don't need to incorporate everything into the photo all the time. Um, if you're using a DSLR, polarizing filters are amazing. They, they kill reflections in glass most of the time. They'll bring out textures and woods and certain materials. Uh, they're, they're incredibly helpful. You will need a tripod if you're using a polarizing filter just because they, they will um, increase your exposure time a little bit. And lastly, you know, it's, it's not your job. Uh, don't worry about the technical stuff. Focus on light, composition, mood. Have fun with it. Like, enjoy the process of trying to take photos of your own project. Um, you, know, you're, you don't have to try and create professional level images. You just have to create photos that you really enjoy for your you know, your own interpretation of the space. And um, yeah, thank you. I just wanna say, yeah, thank you so much for, for everyone that um, tuned in to watch this. I really hope you all enjoyed it and found it informative. If you do wanna check out my work, my website is right there. If you wanna follow me on Instagram, there's a link to, to my Instagram. And I'm just gonna sign out here. And I think we're gonna do a little bit of an AMA. Uh, am I back? Yes, yeah, you're good.
I'm just going to bring that back to yep. Okay. Yep. So um, thank you very much, Riley. This was uh, great. A great presentation, very inspirational, hopefully, <laughs> to all of us. And um, yeah, if any of our members, or by the way, also, we want to thank um, Niagara and London Society of Architects, because also some of their members are attending today. So um, yeah, thank you for coming uh, to our webinar. Um, yeah, so maybe some discounts for our members would be great. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions um, here in the chat. So first one um, is from Yvonne um, and it's what percentage of your work is uh, just retouching? Um, typically for any job, like if I'm on set for a day, it's a day behind the computer. So sometimes it's a bit longer. Generally we do two or three revisions with clients uh, just to make sure everything's perfect and you guys are really happy with the photos. Um, but it, it's the ones, the photos that I showed you, I think are pretty extreme examples. And what I really wanted to, to get through was the point of how we work and, and how extreme that can be. But like that first image, that was kind of nuts. Like we, we, we usually don't go that far, uh, for most shots we do. So sometimes I maybe made, made 10 minutes on a computer for an image. Sometimes I'm spending two or three hours. It, it really varies, um, depending on the scope of work for that particular photo. But at the end of the day, it just matters that you're happy with the shot and that it, it shows what you want. Okay. Okay. There is um. There's another question from Dan. Um, what is your policy about erasing the date radius overhead, like wires and dumpsters and and all of that, in a picture that we don't want? Um. Yeah. Um, I have no issue with that. Uh, you know, like I said, this is this is a commercial job. We don't have to be necessarily one hundred percent. This might sound bad, but we don't have to be honest with. The way the space looks like we're, we're here to make you look good as an architect uh, so if you want wires gone if you want your dumpsters gone if we can do that like if that's actually within our skill set we will quite happily do that for you um and you'll notice too i think if, if you look at other photographers work like we we all do this kind of stuff um there's always a little bit of tweaking a little bit of adjusting so um things like that are are, are i have no qualms about the only time I think I have an issue with really removing objects is if you're you're submitting to awards where that's relevant. Uh, you know, like if you're, I heard a rumor once of a, you know, one instance where the landscaping was completely faked on a project and it was submitted for, you know, a landscaping award. Um, like that's crossing a line, I think, and I feel uncomfortable doing that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in general, I, it's. I have no issues with it. It's totally fine. I'm definitely happy to do that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, we have another question um, from Yvonne too. Um, what are your thoughts on a consistent photographic eye for an entire portfolio? Is it advisable to keep the same photogra photographer for all projects? Um, and is the eye relevant to branding? Mm, it definitely helps. It ties in for sure, but I, you know, I will say once you get to, once you're working with a certain caliber of photographer, we're always going to get the key shots kind of the same to some extent. Um, like there, but we'll, we will have like our own flavor a little bit to every photo. So you can tweak it up there. There's lots of firms that I know that work with multiple photographers. There are some firms that I know hire two or three photographers to photograph the same project. And they just kind of pick and choose which ones they like the best. So mm -hmm. it really depends on the situation and, and really what, you know, if you're happy with your photographer, keep working with them. Um, if you want to try something else out, if you just want to see, you know, what's on the other side of the bridge, go for it. Um, but you know, it, it does tie a little bit into your to your brand a little bit. And if you do work with a new photographer, you do want to make sure they they look at the work that's been done in the past. Uh, the feel is somewhat similar to to what they've done. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, th th there there's always going to be changes. Um, and, and go with your gut on that for sure. And, and just, uh, and, and yeah, try it out, see what happens. <laughs> okay. So um, also related to that question, do you work with any marketing uh, company nope. in particular? Yeah. Me and good old fashioned email. Okay. Um, there was another question. Um, um, if you ever are asked ever to uh, photograph a project under construction, or is it only always like the final 
and pretty product at the end. I do construction. Actually, I do a lot of construction work. Um, and uh, I actually think that some of the most interesting photos are construction shots because they, they show the projects in a really vulnerable and raw state. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they have a lot of commercial value, but uh, from a photography standpoint or from a storytelling standpoint, I think they're, they're fantastic. And I love it when I get asked to go document a project while it's in progress. So actually, if you go on my Instagram, you can see some, some work that I did with uh, Aquacon recently. There's a building up by MJMA and Churchill Meadows. Some nice photos I got of that one. So it's worth checking out. Okay. Um, um, I also have another question, Dan, maybe, I don't know, I, I'll try to, um, it's, uh, it, it relates to the, uh, like erasing like all these um, things around the picture that we don't want to show it. And there is this comment that um, uh, like the OA headquarters has a, a high rise looking near the building um, and has to be erased twice. Um, since the solar array had been installed. So uh, maybe Dan, can you maybe um, just uh, rephrase that question and exactly what would you like to, um, to know? Well, this, it's just a matter of uh, when I saw the photograph, there's a kind of a righteous indignation about uh, these things that really uh, sully and detract from the point of view, which is um, a statement about a, a particular building. And so it's, I, I, I've removed um, rainwater leaders and overhead wires. And I was just making a case of the fact that sometimes it's um, beneficial to remove an entire building, but that's tricky. Yeah, um, I actually, I've done that before a few times where if I, you know, especially if it's a building that's like under construction behind it, um, you know, we'll, we'll usually clean that up or get it out or at least re remove the cranes and things like that, poking out of it, so. Um, yeah, yeah, it's that's that's a request that I've had a few times before. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions, that, um, unless somebody wants to speak up, um, I just want to also mention that the uh, uh, before we wrap up that the uh, GBSA um, it's uh, putting together a, a jury for, um, for a student award project that we are going to be leading uh, this year for the first time. And we're recruiting hopefully GVSA members to be part of that jury. So if you or you know someone that could be in the jury, please um, let us know. Uh, I think the deadline is the end of the, this week. So it'd be great um, to hear from you before. And um, yeah, and uh, the GVSA really wanna thanks uh, Riley for uh, this presentation. I think, um, yeah, it was great. We all got inspired and uh, <laughs> we'll um, hopefully we'll be reaching out um, any of us soon to uh, do some of these amazing photo shoots. All right, thank you everyone. I really appreciate you all uh, taking the time to, uh, to tune in for this. and. Uh, if you have any questions, my contact info is up on my uh, my website. You're more than welcome to shoot me an email, reach out on Instagram, or give me a call even if uh, you want to talk on the phone. I'm, I'm happy to keep answering any questions that you might have. So, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.